70s, where we tried to apply all the fancy emerging systems theory of the early 70s to natural resource problems by building computer models and trying to uh, use those models to make useful management predictions. What we found after probably the first dozen of those case studies was that repeatedly these models failed and they continue to fail today for those same systems that we worked on. And they fail because of ecologic lack of understanding and data about ecological processes that field ecologists don't work on because they're too hard to study. Dispersal, recruitment processes, you can't collect enough data over large enough scales to figure out what's going on. So we ignore them. the publisher perish thing does not promote research in the areas in critical areas that, uh, that we need to build these models. And our ecological theory is, uh, at least back then, and I guess today still is a joke. It really has very little to say that's of value in dealing with natural resource problems. Now, th those views that I just expressed to you don't come from a little bit of experience. They come from a huge amount of experience. I spent uh, most of my time over the first half of my career developing case studies in adaptive management. Our aim was to go into a problem system somewhere, work with teams of people to develop computer models to try to make useful management predictions, and then as we saw those models fail because of lack of information about key processes, we would try to bring people to understand the need to do management experiments to resolve uncertainty about the efficacy of policies. And we did this on a huge range of things. We worked on barren ground caribou up in the Arctic. We worked on the Mackenzie Delta. And uh, we worked on a bunch of case studies on fish. Most of the case studies in adaptive management were not about fish at all. They were about watershed systems and related issues. Uh, one of the neatest case studies we did over the years was on a little old village called Obergurgel in the Austrian Alps where we were modeling. We thought we were modeling the impact of human activities on an alpine environment. What we ended up modeling was the demography and economy of that village to try to help the villagers plan for their economic future in a very restricted uh, ecological environment. Uh, one of the other case studies we're proud of is about the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. We modeled uh, forest insect dynamics, spruce bundle in the eastern forests of Canada. So it's a huge range of case studies. And always this common theme that the models <coughs> failed and that we needed to uh, recommend any management prescriptions be treated as experiments. Well, as you can see from this uh, header on this slide, the failure rate of adaptive management was really high in the sense there are a few cases where we didn't manage to even build models. There were a large number of cases where we put a lot of time and effort, often years of work uh, with people and out, out doing field work with them and so on, uh, where nobody ever did anything experimental where adaptive management was never implemented at all. Uh, there was a, there's a current review just about to come out of conservation <laughs> biology that looks at 1,336 publications that cite me in, 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 in adaptive management. Less than 5% of them show any indication at all that anything was that, any adaptive management was actually done. <laughs> well, this is uh, a huge issue. And we still don't understand why that happens. Uh, there, one of the problems has been that a lot of people have interpreted adaptive management as what we call adaptive management light. The idea that all you need to do is go ahead with management of the fishery or anything else and pretend you know what you're doing and to monitor what's happening and if something goes wrong, take some corrective action. Um, Real adaptive management, the one that starts out with saying, we really don't understand what's going on, we need to treat things as experimental, isn't even <clears> part <throat> of the thinking of most of the people who claim to be involved in adaptive management. Okay, so uh, that's a problem. So what I do is tell you about a success story. Now, there's been one particular case study that started because of Josh Corman. <coughs> Uh, that we've been working on for almost 20 years now, and that's the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Uh, a couple of reasons for working on it for 20 years. One of them is that it is sort of a success story. People are paying attention. 
management experiments are being done. But really, the main reason is that uh, <coughs> there's two kind of people in this world. There's canyon people and other people. <laughs> right. Right. There's people who go into the Grand Canyon, like my number two son, and say, oh gosh, this is pretty. And then they walk away and never think about it again. And then there's other people like me, Josh, my number one son, who uh, <laughs> are addicted. <laughs> I just love the place. Uh, but what goes on in the Grand Canyon is that there's a river that runs through it, the Colorado River. Uh, and there's a study reach from what's called Glen Canyon Dam up at the head of the Grand Canyon down to nearly Lake Mead, uh, where the Colorado River is under intensive investigation and intensive adaptive management experimentation. Uh, this whole system starts at Glen Canyon Dam, a high dam that turned the Colorado River from a muddy, highly seasonal river into a uh, stable, clear water river that now supports things like trout fisheries in the middle of Arizona. So that was, we're standing in this picture. The air temperature when that photo was taken was about 105 Fahrenheit. It was as hot as can be. The water temperature was 8 degrees centigrade and that river is full of rainbow trout. So what Glen Canyon Dam did was to cause a massive change in the hydrology of the, of the river from highly seasonal flows with highly seasonal temperature variation and sedimentation into a system that flatlines most of the time, except when regulatory releases are made during El Nino years or experiments are done to see what the effect of variable <coughs> flow is in the system. Well, that massive change in the hydrology of the Colorado River has, has pretty obviously generated a lot of major ecological changes. The Grand Canyon doesn't have a lot of places for people to camp when they go down into it on rafts and so on, and so one of the key resources in the canyon is sand and, uh, for beaches, and much of the management of the Grand Canyon is aimed at trying to preserve what sand is left and, and restore beaches. A lot of the flow management is done for that point. So beaches are one of the most important resources in the Grand Canyon ecosystem for campers and so on. And then there's trout that have entered the system as an invader and lots of interesting endangered birds and things in the riparian zone. But a really critical focus of adaptive management has been on native fishes. The native fishes are mostly family cyprinidae, the catastrophe, the suckers and chubs and things. They haven't fared very well in the face of the cold water and clear water environment, in particular the vulnerable really high predation impacts from exotic trout and that. So a lot of the Grand Canyon Adaptive Management Program is focused on just two things. On making beaches, saving sand by managing flows, and then on uh, trying to restore the humpback chub, one of the most important native fish, and the only one that's uh, fully endangered on the U.S. endangered species list. So we've been designing our adaptive management program around really those two variables, beaches and, and humpback chub. Uh, thanks, Apple. Uh, the way we work in the Grand Canyon is that uh, most of the canyon is completely inaccessible, except by a little trail. So in order to get research gear and equipment and people down into the canyon, we put uh, rafts into the system up at the head end, and then we work our way down through the canyon on trips that last up to about three weeks at a time. We use these great big freighters to carry the important stuff, beer in particular. The average beer consumption down there is about 10 beers per scientist per day. <laughs> <laughs> and then we use these wonderful little things called sport boats that have a great big engine on a little tiny boat to actually do the sampling work because we can up and down run the various rapids with these little tiny boats. So we can reach most places in the canyon to gather biological and physical information about the, the ecology of the system. Uh, there's a tributary to the Colorado River. I put this picture up because it's really, for two reasons. 
the Little Colorado. It's really beautiful. It's a carbonate stream from a spring, so it's got this wonderful blue color. It also is the main spawning area for a couple of the native fish species that are endangered. So our research work extends up into this tributary, mainly using <coughs> helicopters to get in and access it. Field work and adaptive management of the system is very expensive. It costs about $3 million a year for the various monitoring programs that take place down in the canyon. Every time we launch those rafts, it's 150,000 dollars. That's just, as soon as you leave the dock, you spend 150,000 bucks. So it's not cheap. Despite that, they're still doing adaptive management. One of the key things we learned from the Grand Canyon case study is about the idea of surprise in adaptive management. We say that adaptive management is about learning how systems respond to management treatments. But if you ask what we mean by learning, learning really is things that happen that surprise us. We already knew it, not surprised. We haven't learned anything, right? So a key benefit of adaptive management is best illustrated probably in the Grand Canyon has turned out to be the uh, opportunities for new management approaches and so on that are created by things we didn't think about at all, by things that purely surprised us when they happened. There have been a whole bunch of these surprises in the Grand Canyon program. So just getting out and doing experiments, no matter what they are, turns out to have a significant huge benefit for, for management as well as science. So we've, we've done all sorts of experiments to modify flows, to uh, try to suppress the rainbow trout population so they don't eat the native fish by using electrofishing and flow variation that clobbers them on the time of the year when they spawn and so on and so on. There are two huge policy camps about how to manage water flow in the Grand Canyon. One camp says we should allow flow variation to occur in patterns that are best for power production through the Grand Canyon Dam. But there's a bunch of ecology types who think that what we really need out there is to make the water steady so that it isn't so disruptive to the life histories of creatures. We've done all these different kinds of treatments over the years. And the, we've been surprised by essentially every, the outcomes of essentially every treatment we've done. We didn't correctly predict the outcome of any of the treatments that we've applied. Uh, turns, one of the big things they use in the canyon to uh, manage for sand is to run a, flow, a flood down through the canyon. The flood pushes sand up onto the beaches, but it turns out it also scours the bottom in ways that promote rainbow trout population growth. So you get huge trout recruitments after each of these. That came as a great surprise to us. Uh, beaches that people are trying to build turn out to be much more ephemeral than anybody had hoped. When flows are steady, there's a little beaded string of warm waters created along the river shore, something we never expected in a big, fast river. I've stood in the canyon uh, with the water going by one leg uh, at about five knots, a fast-flowing river, with my wa an air t a water temperature of 10 degrees, and my other leg in a little backwater area behind a rock where the water temperature is 18 degrees, and there's a thermocline right between my legs. This kind of stuff we never imagined until we did these experiments. So I create microhabitats for creatures that require warm water conditions. And it goes on and on like that. You just surprise after surprise after surprise. Uh, some of the things that we've done have ended up being confounded. We did a mechanical removal thing to knock down the abundance of trout in 2004 in there thinking that we could test the effect of that on native fish survival rates. And it coincided exactly with the warming of the river that occurred because of low dam levels. And so today, even though we did this nice experimental treatment, we have no, oh, the, the humpback chub population is starting increasing dramatically right at that time. And we have no idea whether the increases are due to the trout removal to the temperature change or to some combination of them or to something else entirely that we haven't identified yet. But experimentation in these big systems is hard and can, can produce badly confounded results. The biggest surprise, I think, to all of us as ecologists was that uh, native fish didn't respond the way they were supposed to. Uh, there's an experiment that's been going on for about four years now where in the fall we take all of the diurnal variation out of the flow. Normally, 
water levels or water flows go up to say 20,000 CFS during the day when they're producing power, and they drop way down at night. And that was thought that diurnal flow variation is thought to cause major problems to fishes living in the river. So what we did is experiments where we flattened out the flow for periods of several months each fall to see if it would improve native fish survival. Well, to our great surprise, the native fish survival rates went down instead of up as soon as we stabilized the flows. And the really surprising thing to us was that body growth rates are much higher when the water's going up and down and, being, and when it's a nasty environment for the fish than when it's a more favorable environment. Growth goes down with the conditions that every biologist thought would favor these fish. Well, that, that is an amazing surprise, and it creates huge opportunities for management using full fluctuation as a way of actually enhancing the survival of these native fish, where everybody thought before that the effect would be just the opposite, that we hurt them. Well, if you didn't think surprise is important, there's the best example I can show you of it in the field of applied ecology generally. I mean, think of no case study where we've been so absolutely flat, flabbergasted by what the experiments told us compared to what we expected. Okay, the second uh, general uh, work that I've done that I'm proud of is called foraging arena theory today. Uh, foraging arena theory happened because of my number two son, Will. We were out fishing on Roche Lake up in the BC interior, and Will was born, he's leaning on one side of the boat, and he's seeing really large daphne out in the water columns lake. And he says, why don't the fish eat all those daphne, Dad? And I've worked on the effect of fish on zooplankton body sizes before, and I looked and I said, hmm. Those big daphne should not be in this lake. The lake's full of trout. But without even thinking about it, I turned to Will and I said, well, well the, the reason those daphne are out here where we're fishing for the big fish is that the little fish aren't out here too. The little fish are going to get short because if we tether a juvenile rainbow trout out in the middle of Roach Lake here, it'll have a lifespan of about 10 minutes before one of those big fish gets it. So those little fish are occupying a very restricted spatial habitat in response to predation risk. And that habitat restriction is why the food supply for them isn't in such problem. And about 10 minutes after the flood go around, I said, wait a minute, what did I just say to him? I said to him that all our basic ecological theory is this multi They worked on ecopath models. Ecopath is a provides a static description of biomasses of creatures of different types and the flow of the mass between those creatures. Essentially, energy flow pattern. But if we're going to take those kind of descriptions and say anything dynamic about change over time, we've got to predict, make predictions about how those flow rates will vary. When, when the abundance of the creatures vary due to one another and due to impacts on fisheries. The classic ecological theory is all built around this thing called the, well the 
mass action or well mixed system hypothesis that that flow rate is basically going to be proportional to how many of the two players are, there are, how many predators and how many prey. An idea borrowed from your first year chemistry course on the interaction rates and chemical reactions. But foraging your answer theory says no, that's not right at all. The interaction takes place through these vulnerable subpopulations that are very small proportions of the prey population. Prey are exchanging back and forth between them. The trophic interaction involves only the vulnerable components. And it turns out if you take that and you build some kind of nice mathematical model. When you build those mathematical models, you can use them to predict what the behavioral ecology down at scales of meters and minutes that involve these arena interactions, how those feed up to determine limits on and patterns of recruitment <coughs> variation, and at larger and longer scales, trophic interaction rates and ecosystem organization. One of the first things that we discovered when we started following that logical chain using various kinds of modeling is that we could all of a sudden explain one of the most puzzling patterns in aquatic ecology, which is that almost all fish of almost all types, ranging in this example from shad in the Hudson River to anchovies off uh, California to bluefin tuna in the, uh, in the southwestern Pacific, all show the same basic pattern of variation in their recruitment rates with changes in the abundance of eggs deposited by the parents. As you increase egg deposition, there's a rapid increase in recruitment at first, more eggs, more babies. But then over really wide ranges of parental abundance, there's no further increase in recruitment. We could never explain either the shape of this pattern or why the limiting recruitment rates out there are so much lower in general than we predict on the basis of uh, our studies and the resources available those creatures use. So foraging arena theory told us why we see these patterns and gave us a little bit better ways of modeling them. But I think much more importantly, in the early 1970s, we used to build a lot of ecosystem models. We stopped building those models for about 25 years. And the reason was we couldn't make them work. The more biology we put into the models, the more pathologically those models behaved, the more dynamically unstable they were, the more they self-simplified, the predators need all the prey and stuff like that. Well, as soon as we put the foraging arena equations into our models, they went from this kind of crazy, chaotic, complex, dynamic behavior that results in extinction of most creatures over time to patterns much more like we see in the field. We don't see complex cycles very often in the field and aquatic system. We sure as hell don't see massive extinctions in large portions of aquatic ecosystems like those old models produce. So foraging arena theory was really the thing that opened the door when we coupled it with ecosim, or the ecopath, this thing called ecosim models, opened the door to modeling ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems for the purposes of management. And it's been really remarkable. One of the things we've been doing is fitting these ecosim models to time series data from multiple species for a large number of ecosystems. And the general rule is that if you've got fairly long time series data on 20 different kinds of creatures, the ecosim model is going to do a really good job of explaining patterns of variation, historical patterns of variation. And you've got maybe 18 of those 20 species. And that's a pretty good track record. The model that can capture as complex as these dynamics are, the basic long-term behavior of such a large proportion of these ecosystems. Okay, so that's foraging arena theory, and that stuff continues to develop largely through Billy Christensen's work. The other thing I'm kind of proud of is the work that I've done in the development of fishery stock assessment and regulation. The thing I'm most proud of about that work has been a kind of negative thing. And that was uh, figuring out what goes wrong in fish stock assessments. And this picture captures pretty much all of the stuff I've done. 
Now this is a picture of what happened to the Newfoundland cod stock as it collapsed, started to rebuild, and then collapsed down to zero. The red line is a solid estimate because virtually all the fish included in the red line got caught. Right? So we're not real uncertain about what the stock actually was. They got, they got measured on the docks. Uh, those funny lines that you see that start out way above the data and then all go up, each of those is a stock size estimate by uh, DFO scientists on the East Coast and a projection forward after that estimate. So all of the stock size estimates made by DFO scientists from the time Canada took over extended jurisdiction for the cod were massively biased upward and the projections of stock recovery were massively biased upward. You see it right in about right here, they stopped, you stop seeing the projections. What happened was that somebody blew, Danny Rivard blew the whistle on me and pointed out that in retrospect, when we could look back, that these estimates had been no good. So what DFO did in response to that wasn't to stop making the bad estimates, it was to promote Danny to Ottawa and not publish the estimates anymore. <laughs> right. People say, well, the, the fishermen pushed the government into causing the cod collapse or the scientists boozed over that, blah, blah, blah. The, the government followed those scientific estimates and recommendations to the letter in, in the cod case. So the collapse of the cod, that's the worst social disaster in the history of the country, was directly caused by our profession. It was directly caused by bad fisheries assessments. And the mistakes that were made to cause these overestimates are mistakes that a high school kid might make. They're really stupid blunders in the way the assessment calculations were done and the assumptions made. And there wasn't any subtle about cod biology or anything else. It was plugging in an assumed harvest rate of 20% to start their calculations when the data told them clearly that the harvest rate was much higher than that. That kind of stupid blunder in doing the assessment. They admit the assessment methods were wrong, is that they were applied incorrectly by people with inadequate stock assessment training. Okay, so I, and I, I've been working on various kinds of methods. Most of my students have been working on various kinds of methods for avoiding that kind of thing in the future. For developing better assessments, for figuring out what kind of data we really need to manage fisheries properly. One of the biggest lessons from that is that what we do not need is catch and effort. That does not solve any problem in fisheries management and assessment by itself. Now there's two main problems over my career that I've worked on, on and off, that I just have defeated as a scientist. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what has happened. One of them is that every major big fish stock collapse in the world is involved a massive contraction in the spatial range of the stock that made them much more vulnerable to harvesting and, uh, and resulted in recruitment failure. We don't understand that. And the other one is the perpetual salmon ecologist thing of what the hell causes cyclic population changes. This range of expansion contraction that I'll show you a little bit of what's following. On the left here is a picture of the largest fishery in the world, the, the biomass changes in the Fru Anchoveta stock. Oh, so that's the largest fish stock in the world. The stock collapsed massively during an El Nino event in the early 1970s, and has subsequently recovered. So if you went to the Larkin lectures, you know everything's fine now. It didn't, it didn't look fine. If you look closely at the recruitment biology of what happened during uh, during the collapse and after, compared to the other time, what you see is two different recruitment patterns. One indicative of a stock that has a low carrying capacity in the field, and the other indicative of a stock that can be much larger before its recruitment rates are suppressed. And those are associated with the stock occupying very much smaller spawning ranges, and its juveniles being restricted to much smaller foraging arena environments. Uh, during these low abundance periods than during the high abundance periods. And we just do not understand at all what's driving the expansion and contraction dynamic for range in these systems. Why are all the fish moving into so few areas and creating intense competition that slows population recovery? And then the good old cyclic dominance story, I suppose most of you know that 
some of our Pacific salmon population have these really violent cycles that have run up and down the giant Adams River sockeye run of 2010, which is one of the biggest of these peaks. And in between are these little tiny low abundances. And these little tiny low abundances in most of the stocks have stayed low despite various fisheries regulations aimed at trying to rebuild them and so on. We don't understand what causes these cycles. They have profound management implications. There are two different arguments. One argument is we should try to get rid of them and have lots of salmon all the time. So our attempts to do that have failed catastrophically. And the other argument says we need to reinforce these because it's important to have some kind of fallow rotation dynamics in the sockeye nursery like just as that people do in agriculture. And if we break up the cycles through management, we'll ultimately end up with a whole lot fewer fish uh, than if we reinforce the cycles. We can't answer that question. We can't resolve those alternative hypotheses. And we're not getting any closer to resolving them with our science. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about personal regret about this uh, Probably the top regret I have is that I have had a lot of papers that didn't get published, including a whole bunch of them that were carried right through the review process to acceptance subject to revision, where I just said, hell with this, I'm not interested anymore, I've turned my back on them. Right? Something like 10 papers or 15 papers that got far in, that were accepted, and I just been too lazy to do the final work, and, or didn't have somebody like Steve Martell I could pass them on to, and they would do all the nasty work to get published. I've been really lazy uh, in my publication career. Another thing is that I don't think I've been a good mentor for graduate students over the years. I think I could have done a lot more to have uh, helped them, not so much while they were students, but more after they left. A good mentor ought to help people build their careers, not just build their education. Particularly earlier in my career, I abandoned a whole lot of people way too soon in their careers. I'm deeply regretful about the failure of adaptive management over the years, obviously, all the time and effort I put into it and that we don't understand why it happens. We don't understand what the institutional things are that are causing adaptive management to continue to fail. Uh, another thing I'm not proud of at all is that I think I've made some really unwise recommendations over the years for fisheries policy. And more importantly, I've made those recommendations in a very public way. Back in the 1980s, a bunch of us, Randall and I and others, were looking at Chinook and Coho salmon populations around the Georgia Strait, and we saw them declining. And we assumed that those declines were caused by fishing. And we very publicly spoke out in newspapers and so on about how overfishing was causing this decline, and that there needed to be fisheries closures and major policy changes to correct the situation. And there were those policy changes. Uh, thing is, we were wrong. Those salmon declines didn't have anything to do with fishing, as evidenced by the fact that the fishery closures did not do anything to promote recovery. The stock was stayed down as part of complete closures of fisheries. The causes of the decline involve a decline in marine survival rate. But what's really spooky is that we had the marine survival data all the time that were telling us that it was not fishing during the time when I was waving my arms in newspapers and on radio and television about the need for fisheries regulation. We had the evidence, and I chose to ignore it. Basically, I couldn't, after the ego trips of having all that publicity, I couldn't be honest with myself. I couldn't sit down and admit that I had been wrong. Uh, I couldn't admit it to myself, let alone to the public. And that's bad business. I am deeply regretful about that. So let me, uh, this seminar is fairly short, but I thought the big pick was going to take a lot of time given that it's awards and some money. That's a token that ends fairly early. There's probably three lessons I think are important to leave with students. 
Uh, number one is don't let your curiosity alone or the methods you learn to use as a student. Uh, drive your research into the future. Arise to the challenge that policy questions raise. But don't go do research on something because it's convenient. Do research on things that are important. Try to deal with the policy problems. Try to deal with the questions that involve those huge gaps in our understanding of where policy prediction has been impossible. Have a go at it at least. So that if someday you just go back to fiddling around in your lab or I go back to wandering the shores of mountain lakes, you can at least say you tried at least give it a reasonable effort. Uh, another, th the second thing is that you are as a scientist in training and later on, you have absolutely no value to anyone unless you're honest, completely honest. And that begins with being willing to admit your own mistakes. Always look at yourself harder than you look at anyone else. It is deeply unfortunate that many very prominent scientists, including scientists in Fisher, have never once, over the entire period of their careers, ever once admitted any of their mistakes. You don't want to be like that. And the third thing is, for those of you who think that you're going to go out from the Fishery Center and be a good conservation advocate as well as a good scientist, is science and advocacy like I did in the 80s, just do not mix. If you're going to be a policy advocate, don't pretend and don't expect anyone else to imagine that you're also an honest scientist. You're not. OK, that's sort of the close. Uh, I just want to acknowledge a few people who uh, shaped my career. Uh, they started with Buzz Holly, my mentor here at UBC, Ray Hillborn, who's a co co developer of adaptive management. <coughs> my wonderful wife. Jim Kitchell, who pushed me in directions that had never gone. Josh Corman, who co developed much of the adaptive management, case studies, and work with Dan Payne. And Billy Christensen, who's kept me going with Ecosim and Ecosystem Modeling long after I would have wandered back to my mountain lake shores. And then I thank all of you who are my students. You shaped my career as much as these people. And I hope that I help to shape yours. Thank you. Carl, thanks for a very informative uh, retrospective view of your career. There's one topic that I think you really contributed to that you didn't mention due to shortage of time, and I'd like your sense of where the future is in that, and that's the notion of non-stationary parameters. Okay, we're dealing with a world that's changing, and well, it always has been, but maybe it's changing faster than it used to be. And from a management point of view, that's uh, quite a challenge, because for one, your adaptive management ideas assume something there's stable about the underlying structure out there that you can get feedback on and then respond to. But that, that, that structure is changing out from under you. And so what do you recommend for dealing with this issue of non-stationarity in the future? Uh, yeah. It, this is one of these places where our history in trying to quantify dynamics and build models and so on came from the wrong place came from chemists and physicists and others who deal with physical systems that are constructed to be predictable in some sense of the time. Ecosystems aren't that way. Things are changing out there dramatically. The, there's, with climate change, there's invasions of creatures, new creatures occupying our ecosystem, changing mortality regimes and so on. 
There's no such thing as a parameter in ecology. You know, there are physiological parameters that organisms have that affect how they perform ecologically. But there's no ecosystem out there that in any sense is going to look 20 years from now exactly like it looked today, unless it's an ecosystem that changes very slowly. And then it's actually changing, we're just too stupid to see it. We're just not thinking on the right place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all ecosystems are highly non-stationary. We do not have either the statistical technology, the monitoring technology, or the, think, the thinking about how to deal with that change well. Uh, the methods that we have for detection of change, like your common filter tracking methods for productivity and stock to food relationships, are vulnerable to catastrophic failure if different parameters are changing and we assume we're still mm -hmm. doing so. We can't deal with our data in short time blocks because ecological data have what's called a mad scientist problem. Nature is deliberately feeding us misleading patterns because its dynamics are linked to the variation itself. Kids in the 504 class heard that this morning. So we don't have an answer to this. Now, Holling's answer is adaptivity, is that we must design for the capability to respond onto the variation as we observe it developing. And that that flexibility is really the critical thing. And that means that we must not become involved in management policies that involve fixed rules that we assume are going to be the same year after year after year after year. So the fixed escapement levels that try to manage some of our salmon stocks to today are just not appropriate for the productivity of the stock. They're completely wrong, and it's causing major losses to fishing industry. And it goes on and on like that. So we got to keep trying to do what you're doing, figure out how you, you've done, to try to figure out how to track the changes 